chapter 7, uh, verse 13 to 29, a message entitled uh, uh, Decision as we uh, continue on here and, um, and actually conclude the uh, Sermon on the Mount that we began, began uh, several, several weeks ago. We'll have a word of prayer and then we'll, we'll jump in here. Father, we do pray that once again you'd uh, again just help us bring our hearts and minds to your word that you might uh, speak to us, God, and we... Uh, we just pray that uh, this idea of the decision, uh, a narrow road, a broad road, so important that we understand that uh, we each need to make a decision for you or, uh, or against you at some point in time, Lord, and uh, uh, that we'd understand that in, in terms of presenting the truth of Christ to our, our friends and family members as, as well. And uh, Lord, we thank you that you've provided a road that leads to e eternal life. So again... Uh, just by your spirit, bring these things to our hearts and minds that we'd really truly comprehend them today in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, in a book by Bruce uh, Lockaby, he uh, called uh, Thinking and Acting Like a Christian, he tells a story of, uh, of a gal that was a world-class runner. She was from uh, New York, and she was scheduled to run in a, in a race in Connecticut. She had her map, and she headed off that day in what she thought was plenty of time. And she began to realize at some point uh, along the way that... Um, she may be off track a little bit and a little bit lost or whatever. So doing what a guy would never do, she pulled into a gas station and asked for directions. And, uh, and then he assured her he knew where the race was, drew her a little map and got her back on track. And she was hurriedly, she gets there just in time, stretches a little bit, boom, the gun goes, she's off in the race. And, uh, and predictably, she, she won the race. Uh, at the uh, end of the race, though, as she was kind of... Uh, Still stretching, she was kind of looking around for the envelope with the prize money. She's a professional runner. That's why she went there that day, uh, hoping to win, hoping for the prize money. And, uh, and it was, no one was walking up to her. And so she finally uh, went to one of the officials and, and inquired, uh, and they informed her that she had actually run in the wrong race. <laughs> she got to a race, but it wasn't the race she thought that it was. Uh, and that's the point of this teaching this morning uh, when Jesus lays out that uh, there's a warning uh, because we, we need to make sure we make a right decision in life in terms of whether we're going to walk with the Lord or not. And apparently, because he will say, he'll quote, there will be many on that day, on the judgment day, that will say, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, I never knew you, depart from me. There'll be people that were in a race, thought they were in the right race, but in the end, there's no prize. And, and it's only at the end that they realize that uh, it's all been for, for naught. Uh, again, key verse in the Sermon on the Mount, of which this is just the, uh, the concluding uh, couple of uh, statements and illustrations, is found in Matthew 5, 24. I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, your righteousness, they're having to uh, comprehend that, their understanding. If only two people made it to heaven, it would be a scribe and a Pharisee. Now Jesus is telling them that their righteousness would have to surpass that. Whose righteousness would that be? Who could do that? Only one person, and that's Jesus Christ. And that's his whole point. It's only through him that we would enter heaven. It's only through his righteousness. He then would give us the ability internally to change us so that we could begin to live out the Sermon on the Mount. The Pharisees and the scribes would never be able to do that. They could keep the written code, uh, but their hearts were really never changed. A couple of warnings. Again, Jesus warns against making the wrong choice in life. Then he'll warn us to watch out for false prophets. And third, he'll warn us against not applying the Word of God to our lives. So verse 13 and 14. 
Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So very clearly, Jesus says very simply, there are two paths to choose. Uh, and first, he warns us against the choice that leads to destruction. He describes it as being through a wide gate, through a, a broad road, and, uh, and so forth. So this would be uh, the, the natural way to go, the uh, easy to way to go, the popular way to go, where most people are, are going. If you make no definite choice, because as he'll get to enter through the gate, it's a command. You must enter through the gate with an explanation point, or else... Uh, so there's a point in time when you need to make a decision, a choice to, uh, to do that. It's uh, very much a concern. Sometimes when you uh, meet someone, you begin to talk to them, you find out that <clears throat> they're a Christian, uh, you talk to them a little bit, and you say, well, when did you become a Christian? Oh, I've always been a Christian. Well, no, but yeah, but when did you actually, you know, become a Christian? When did you make that decision? Oh, I've just, I grew up in the church. Yeah, but... You see, Jesus says there is a point in time when every person must decide to enter a narrow gate and go against the flow of the prevailing culture and, uh, and so forth. And certainly uh, there could be that uh, person that's uh, <coughs> isolated in a, in a fairly uh, Christian community, works in a Christian business or something like that. For, but for most of the people in the world, it's not going to be an easy thing to do. Uh, everything about the idea of entering through a, a narrow gate means there is going to be a, a resistance to it. Everything uh, about it means you're going to be, sometimes we say, counterculture. You'll be going against the culture if you do that. If you're flowing with the culture, it means you're going down the, the broad road that leads to destruction. Uh, we live near Castle High School, <clears throat> just a block or so away, and I uh, always, uh, I sometimes get a kick out of waiting at the stoplight and watching uh, all the kids walk by on their way to high school. And I'm always uh, uh, amazed as uh, being the old guy reflecting back now. Because uh, when I was that age, I thought, you know, we were so cool and we were so independent. We had our freedom. We were so different, of course, than the generation before us. When in reality, now I look back and, wow, they all dress the same. It's like a uniform. Guys have this uniform. Gals have this uniform. They speak the same. They walk the same. They have the same values. They're all clones of each other. I don't see a lot of freedom in that, <laughs> in that. I don't see a lot of independence in that. But you have this mentality, although that's the same. Why is that? Because of peer pressure. Now, of course, at 18, that all stops, right? <laughs> no, there's, a, there's a constantly still, you know, uh, maybe you learn to deal with it differently, but there's still a constant peer pressure culturally uh, to look a certain way, act a certain way, have certain values and so forth. Jesus calls that the broad road that leads to uh, to uh, destruction, something to be concerned about. Uh, secondly, about this um, choice, he can, uh, again commands us to take the narrow road. As I mentioned, it is a, a command. It's through a narrow gate. Uh, only a few will enter it, uh, whereas everybody else is going in, in the other direction. So again, in other words, a person must examine the road they're on to really determine if they're on the right road or not. Uh, we might say uh, at some point in time, there needs to be some risk management assessment going on. <laughs> and a lot of times we don't, we don't think about that. And, and you can see people headed in a certain direction. And sometimes you try to talk to them and say, don't go that way. Don't be with them. Don't make that decision. This is going to hurt. It's going to destroy you. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but in three months and six months, don't keep going in that direction. It's, very, it's, it's tough. It's difficult when you can see somebody uh, doing that, but you can't seem to restrain them or show them. Can't you look down the road far enough to not make that decision, to not go that way? It was kind of illustrated to me uh, uh, several years ago with an accident that took place on the Big Island. I want to show you a little, a little slide here for in sequence, the next one. Uh, that's an undisclosed location on the Big Island. We don't talk about where it really is, and it's really not that beautiful. The fishing really isn't that good, and it's not a very good place to camp, if anybody asks. Uh, anyway, with that said, uh, the, the waterfalls in the back there, those back three, it's either the middle one or the one on the right where the clouds are, are coming down. 
um, uh, we've got good friends that uh, live in the area, and one of the gals is an emergency room nurse, or she was at the time, and she told us a story knowing that we were familiar with the area, that up above there uh, in the clouds, it obviously levels out in its uh, ranch land. Uh, some uh, kids, um, uh, 18 to 20, I'm sorry, when you're my age, that's still kids, uh, when the, they come from Kona, and uh, they were going to hike in and go, which they did over several fences that said no trespassing, until you get to uh, an area of flumes where you could jump in with your inner tube and kind of float along and enjoy the, the countryside on a, on a sunny afternoon, which they did. And there was a group of them, there was a point in time where the flume split, uh, and, and most of the group went one way, and a few of the gals went this way. And a couple of the gals that went this way went over that waterfall. Uh, fortunately for them, they, they hit about, about 60 feet down in a small pool that wasn't very deep. And so lots of broken bones, uh, internal injuries, uh, severe bleeding and so forth. But they managed to hang on to the rocks. Otherwise, they wash over about another 900,000 feet. Uh, the, the folks that uh, went the other way at some point in time realized that uh, nobody's with them any longer. What happened to the other three gals? And so they jump out of the water, hike back, and, and then, uh, you know, fortunately didn't jump into their inner tubes, but walked uh, to the edge to see what had happened, called 911. Uh, at that point, uh, really miraculously, the fire rescue guys came in uh, and uh, the guy went down on the harness, hooked him up, and, uh, and got uh, all of the gals uh, out of there. And within minutes uh, or moments almost, uh, the cloud cover just, just came in like it t uh, typically is in the afternoon. If they had been five minutes later, they would have never could have found him. Uh, they pull him out, and then that's where we kind of know the rest of the story because they took him to, uh, Honoka uh, to the hospital there, to the emergency room, and they had months ahead of recuperation and so forth, but their lives were spared. Now, it's interesting, then, the follow-up to that story is a little bit, their parents then began uh, uh, proceeding to sue the ranches because they had not given sufficient warning to keep them out of those flumes and from uh, imminent danger, even though they had crossed over several fences that said no trespassing. There was no giant side that said, uh, you will die if you get into this uh, flume or so forth. I don't know what they were really uh, expecting. Uh, that's not the case here. Jesus is doing everything he can to try to let people know, watch out, you must. I command you to enter a narrow gate, a difficult way. It's not the way everybody else is going. Because if you keep going that way, it leads to destruction. That's just another word for hell. Uh, just this way lurch to life. That's a reference to heaven and eternal life. Uh, and again, the concern of Jesus here. But often we don't do well when it comes to risk management. There's a, another article I wanted to read a pretty lengthy quote from, from a guy named Jeffrey Kluger, uh, writing a, a story in, ter in terms of uh, titled, Why We Worry About the Things We Shouldn't. And uh, he says, as human beings, we pride ourselves on being the only species that understands the concept of risk. Yet we have a confounding habit of worrying about mere possibilities while ignoring probabilities of building barricades against perceived dangers while leaving ourselves exposed to real ones. For example, we agonize over the avian flu, which as of December 06 had killed precisely no one in the U.S., but we have to, have to be conjoled into getting a vaccination for the common flu, which contributes to the deaths of 36,000 Americans each year. White knuckle flyers who return, routine, excuse me, routinely choose the car when traveling long distances, uh, heedless to the fact that at most a few hundred people die in U.S. commercial airline crashes in a year, compared with 44,000 killed in motor vehicle wrecks. We wring our hands over the mad cow disease that might be, but most certainly isn't, in our hamburger, yet worry far less about the cholesterol that contributes to the heart disease that kills 700,000 of us annually. Shoppers still look aghast at a big bag of spinach for fear of E. coli bacteria while they fill their car carts with fat ridden french fries and salt crusted nachos. Boy, they sure are good though. Uh, we put uh, filters on our faucets, install air ionizers in our homes, and lather ourselves with antibacterial soap. At the same time, 20% of us adults still smoke. Nearly 20% of drivers and more than 30% of backseat passengers don't use seat belts. In short, 
shadowed by the peril as we are, you would think we'd get pretty good at distinguishing the risk likeliest to do us in from the ones that statistically are the long shots, but you'd be wrong. Uh, we're not very good sometimes at uh, uh, ascertaining where the real danger is. And Jesus is doing everything he can as he concludes the Sermon on the Mount to lay it on the line and saying that there's a broad road and it's leading to destruction. And many are going that way. Uh, and there's a narrow gate, a narrow road that leads to eternal life. Uh, by implication then, as I said, the narrow road is much more difficult. In our Truth Project, when we were going through each week, we saw a different area of what we call the cosmic battle. Here is the way the world thinks, which John the right, says that this is the, uh, the, the era of the, of the Antichrist, the thinking of, the Christ, of those that are against Christ. And he says the whole world is like that. So there's that side, and then there's another side uh, that really represents the, the truth. And there's a battle going on between these two things. And we saw it in terms of philosophy and psychology and science and a number of other uh, issues as we went through it. And certainly, uh, here's one of those ways. Jesus says in Mark 8.34, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? And yet there's a whole world that says, no, you're supposed to love yourself. In fact, you can't even really love anyone else until you learn to love yourself. You, you need to center your world around yourself and uh, in your own achievements and so forth. And Jesus says that's one side and that's the broad road that's leading to destruction. But there's a narrow road by implication. It's, it's more difficult. There's more resistance. Uh, it's not the way that everybody else is going, but it's a decision that uh, we need to make. Uh, the girls uh, uh, in the inner tubes floating down there had no idea what waited before them. Uh, their parents were concerned later. There should have been a greater warning, uh, and Jesus is trying to, uh, to warn us uh, at this point. Again, his, his whole uh, idea he's trying to present is that of true righteousness, uh, and that would only be found in him. So there's a warning against making a wrong choice in life. And secondly, Jesus warns us to watch out for false prophets, verse 15 to 23. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. A couple things about this idea of a warning of false prophets. And the first one is false prophets dis disguise themselves as sheep when inwardly they are ferocious wolves. The term watch out is kind of a watch out. It implies that there's uh, danger ahead. Uh, and it's a danger that is echoed throughout the New, New Testament. Paul, when he's on his way to Jerusalem in the book of Acts, what he assumes to be the last time, uh, knowing that he may not see any of his other church leaders uh, any, any longer, uh, he stops at the, the shores and the beach there at Miletus, and he calls for the elders to come down from Ephesus. Uh, and as he kneels there on, on the beach, telling them that he'll probably never see them again, he says this uh, to them. He says, I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will rise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after themselves. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning you day and night with tears. 
Jesus is concerned, Paul's concerned. We'll look in a moment the fact that Peter is concerned, the fact that there will be false prophets, false teachers. We're not talking about other world religions. Nobody's confused uh, as to whether uh, people that are Buddhists or Hindus somehow are Christians as well. That's, that's not the issue. He's talking the concern that people rise up right within the church that appear to be Christian. Uh, they, they look like it. They talk like it. If there's a smell, they smell like it. I mean, they, uh, they are indistinguishable to us. Uh, but Jesus says we're to know them by their fruits. Again, a couple of things. Since they look like sheep... They're familiar with God's word. Since they look like sheep, uh, they're in church on a regular basis. Since they look like sheep, they're familiar with Christianese or Christian phrases and, and terminology. Since they look like sheep, we will not be able to tell who they are by looking at them. Uh, they will have nothing to do with their dress or, or their appearance. I, I remember there's a, a kind of a well-known politician here locally uh, that would share the same moral values that, that we have. And he was uh, uh, instrumental in a lot of uh, pro-life and pro-family uh, causes and so forth. And uh, a number of years ago, one of the, one of the guys uh, had said to me, hey, I heard this guy speak, man, it was re he was really dynamic and real concerned about this issue that we're concerned about. Maybe we could have him come share sometime at church. Well, I said, well, uh, you find out where he fellowships so I can talk with his pastor first. <laughs> Son of a gun, he wasn't a Christian at all. In fact, he was in like a little cult uh, that's an offshoot of Hinduism, uh, very similar to Hare Krishna, you know, but they have their own little guru, a guy that grew uh, from the North Shore. I'm not sure how he uh, got to be a god on his way to town, but that happened apparently, and now he's, uh, people, you know, worship, in this group worship him. Uh, but this guy speaks the lingo, since, and he's been around for a while. And since then, I've had a number of people come to me and say the same thing. I heard this guy. Oh, he's just such a great speaker, and just what a sweet brother in the Lord. <laughs> he's not a brother in the Lord. Really? <laughs> uh, because looking at him and, uh, and listening, if you're not listening, careful, because he can speak Christianese. Uh, again, uh, just an illustration, but it's the concern. Uh, Paul says we won't be able to recognize them. This is what he says in 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen: For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising that if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness, their end will be what the nations deserve. Uh, again, so we need to be very careful because we will uh, will be deceived otherwise. Uh, they can masquerade as servants of righteousness. So again, how will we know who they are? Well, it goes a little further than that. I want to read a passage uh, from the Old Testament from Deuteronomy uh, that's important as well. Here in Deuteronomy 13, 1, it says, if a, Moses writing, if a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a miraculous sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder of which he has spoken takes place, and he says, let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Wow. So not only can we not tell by looking at them, uh, and they can speak Christianese, some of them will have the ability to actually do signs and wonders, to actually prophesize and have them come true. I, I can remember at a point in time before I came to the Lord, and there was a time even as a young Christian that I was still under the impression that if, if somebody had done or said something that you know, seemed miraculous, uh, only God could do the, mir uh, the miraculous, so that person must be from God, and therefore it would be okay to listen to them and read their books and so on and so forth. It's called the New Age Movement. <laughs> and some of them can do the miraculous. They can do it. I, you know, and I, I know other Christians now that have uh, studied with some of these gurus in India and stuff that, I mean, the car runs out of gas and they pour water in it and they start up the engine and they keep on going down the road. They can do some pretty miraculous things that are, that are not parlor tricks uh, by any means. It, it doesn't mean they should have credibility. So Jesus is very concerned 
uh, there's a broad road that everybody seems to be going down. There's a very narrow road uh, that, is, that is a more difficult road. It's a more difficult decision. It is counterculture. And besides that, there are those trying to deceive to take people down a broad road. And it's very hard to distinguish because they're going to rise up right within the church. Uh, they're going to be false teachers masquerading as servants of righteousness. They might even have the ability to prophesy and have something come true. They might even have the ability to do some kind of signs and wonders. So it's a real concern. Let's look at the second part of this. False prophets can be recognized by their fruit and Jesus is very explicit here. Each tree bears the fruit of that tree. The good tree bears good fruit. A bad tree bears bad fruit. Seems pretty simple. Jesus says we need to be fruit inspectors. But uh, again, how are we to be fruit inspectors given what uh, we've uh, just examined? Well, it's by listening very carefully and listening to what they say and then looking at it in the light of God's word and seeing if it matches up or not. Just a, uh, a few days ago, I was at a memorial service for a family member and um, appreciated the guy that did the, uh, the eulogy. And, and uh, he was just, uh, he was, I, knew, I knew that he was a believer and, uh, and everything. And, so, and he was a very funny guy. And uh, he's uh, 86 years old. And he starts out by, by saying, they asked me to do the eulogy. And I thought, hey, no problem. And then I started to think, hey, shucks, my memory's not too good these days. <laughs> That's okay, I'll talk to some other people and write it down. And he says, oh, yeah, but then my glasses no work either. <laughs> so given the fact that I cannot read and I cannot remember, let's go ahead. <laughs> and he did a great job. He did a great job. But then the guy that gave the message, the one that was um, supposedly the, the minister that was there, I listened to him very carefully. And within just a few minutes, I knew that he was a Jehovah's Witness. And his gospel was a different gospel. And when he prayed and closed his prayer in the name of Jesus, the Son of God, his Jesus is a different Jesus. His Jesus, that's the Son of God, well, he's just the, uh, uh, you know, one of, he's Michael the Archangel. He's not Jesus who is God come in the flesh to die for our sins. But I'd be willing to bet, I didn't do this inner survey and run around to people, are you a Christian? Yes, well, did you think that person just speaking was a Christian or not? But I think if I would have done that, certainly wouldn't have done that, but if I had, I would think it would have been maybe the majority, maybe 70, 80%, maybe 90% of Christians that were there would have assumed that that person was a Christian, but he wasn't. You have to listen very carefully. Because about 80, 85, maybe 90% of what he said was true. And the scriptures that he gave were in context. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. But there's an element that's not true. So we have to be fruit inspectors. And to do that, we have to listen very carefully. Now the third thing, false prophets will claim to have done the work of the Lord. Uh, we see that they have claimed to prophesy in Jesus' name. Uh, many of them will do the right things. They drive out demons. They perform miracles and so forth. But uh, I want to take you to a few passages in, uh, in 2 Peter. So if you're a Bible underliner, you might want to turn there. Otherwise, I have the verses for you. But Peter uh, really speaks extensively about the false teachers that would come that were in his day but would come in the future as well. And uh, he gives us a lot more insight into how to be a good fruit inspector. 2 Peter 2.1 says, uh, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, that's their method, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, that's their motivation, these teachers will exploit you with stories they've made up. So again, not to spend too long in this, but how are we to be fruit inspectors? Because it's difficult to tell. We need to be good listeners and compare what they're saying to the word of God. And we need to notice they will secretly introduce destructive heresy. A heresy, something that uh, is different or contradictory uh, to the word of God. Now again, keep in mind, I'm not talking about people that we have disagreements, what I call non-eternal issues in the body of Christ. I mean, I had, I had fabulous teachers in 
uh, in graduate school, none of whom were Calvary Chapel guys, all of whom I had theological disagreements with, but I loved them and learned tremendously from them because the disagreements were, were not going to be anything that would keep somebody out of heaven. The gospel itself, the inspiration of scripture, the trinity of God, sinfulness of man, uh, Jesus Christ is our only savior and redeemer, all of that we're, uh, we're solid on. So I was never concerned about it because when we get to heaven, then they'll realize that I was right all along anyway. So that's the mark of real maturity when you can wait for other people to realize you're, you're really right later. Again, just kidding, but the idea, I'm not talking about peripheral issues. I'm talking about denying the G Jesus, de that he's the, uh, the, the son of God, uh, denying the gospel, that you're saved by your work somehow and so forth. Oh, how do they come? They come secretly, destructive heresies. Why do they do it? It's their greed, um, Peter says. I, I don't do this, but I've got friends that do this when some of these guys come to town uh, they'll just they'll go to their big events at the Blaisdell just to hear what they say, what goes on, and so forth. I don't do that because it would just make me angry, <clears throat> and I got enough things in life that make me angry, so I don't I don't need it, you know. Uh, that's why I don't watch them on TV either. But I have friends that do, and uh, <clears throat> one of them was telling me that uh, yeah, he was amazed because the the one guy that came uh, a few years ago. Uh, very popular and so forth. He took four offerings before he ever uh, got up to give his message, by the way, which he never presented the gospel. Several thousand people full in that arena full never shared the gospel one time. It was just, come forward, you might be healed. If you're healed, we're going to have you share a testimony, get everybody excited and stuff. If you get excited enough, we'll take another off offering. Peter says, that's like a tip right there. When, when money is a big issue uh, and manipulation is a big issue, he said, be, be careful. Further down in verse 10, he says that they are bold and arrogant. These men are not afraid to slander celestial beings, yet even angels, although they are stronger and more powerful, uh, again, Peter says, uh, don't even go there. But again, it speaks of their attitude. They have a method, a motivation, uh, pride. Uh, you, can, uh, you can see that. And then down in verse 15, uh, they have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Beor, who love the wages of wickedness. So again, uh, money is an issue. Fruit inspecting. Jesus says, be careful. There's a point in time when everybody needs to make a decision to walk the narrow road, to follow Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Sometimes you talk about people backsliding away from the Lord. Nobody front slides. <laughs> Nobody's grandfathered in. It doesn't matter if you grew up in the church. It doesn't matter who your father and mother you are. At some point in time, you have to make a decision to follow the Lord, and by implication, it will be difficult, it will not be easy. You must deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow Him. Because if you want to save your life, you'll lose it. But if, you want to, but if you'll give your life away to Christ, then you'll, you'll save it. Again, what does it gain a man to profit the whole world, but lose his very soul? Those aren't my words, those are the words of, of Jesus Christ. You'll be counterculture. It will never be easy. But if you get to the end, there's a prize. As opposed to getting to the end and finding out you're on the wrong way, the wrong race, and there's nothing uh, at the end. But we need to be careful because along the way, there's false prophets and false teachers. And the way that we are fruit inspectors is by listening carefully and knowing our Bibles and we can also notice what their motivation is and be careful because it's from among us and they secretly introduce heresy. Does that go on? <laughs> Absolutely. It goes on all, all the time. The third thing, Jesus warns against not applying his word. Very familiar illustration to us, verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash." When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority 
and not as their teachers of the law. So the first part of this warning is that we're to apply the teaching or the words of Jesus to our lives. And if we are, we're like the man, the wise man who built his house upon the rock. There's a couple of things that are very important in the illustration of Jesus to notice is that both houses are identical. There's no distinguishing from one to the other. Uh, and again, this is a metaphor for a person's life. There's a person who is a, uh, uh, a disciple of Jesus who's made that commitment to Christ uh, and he is taking the word of God, the word of Jesus, he's applying it to his life. And his house is like a house built on a rock. But again, the rock is the foundation. It's below the surface. The other house, uh, the person has never done that. But his house looks exactly the same. Below the surface, though, it's nothing but sand. But just looking, just looking, you cannot distinguish between the two. Uh, and you'll never be able to tell until the storm comes. And it's not a matter of if the storm comes, it's when the storm comes. In our life, at some point in time, if God is merciful enough, he will bring enough tribulation into our life and enough suffering in our lives. As C.S. Lewis says, when God brings suffering in our lives, he's shouting at us to get our attention. It's, not for, uh, it's, it's for a very good reason, sometimes to show us that we've never taken the word of God and we've never applied it to our lives. Uh, again, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again, he tells Nicodemus in, uh, in John 3.3. 3. Uh, and, and again, no one can see the kingdom of God here, he says, unless he does the will of my Father who's in heaven. What's the will of uh, God the Father in heaven? That we would make that decision and choose to walk the narrow road. Uh, and sometimes these storms come and uh, we're not even aware of what's going on until it happens. It appears to be the same. The, again, Jesus is saying that there are lots of people that think that they are Christians and they're not. There's lots of people sitting in churches all over our country today that think that one day they're going to be in heaven. And according to Jesus, they won't. And it's a real concern of Jesus. And it should be a concern for us. Why? <laughs> because there's a broad road that is easy to go down. The other one is very narrow. It's hard. It's difficult. It's a decision that people make at a point in time. There are false prophets and false teachers that are actually enticing through deceptive teaching to actually go the wrong way. Well, that's not helpful, is it? On top of it, a person's life on the surface can look just like a born-again Christian. And the only difference is when difficulty, tribulation, or maybe suffering comes, and we find out there's quite a contrast. Let's go to James 1.22. It's kind of the classic passage on uh, this idea of not applying the word of God. Here James says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do it, do what it says, is like a man who looks at the he had his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. So important that we're taking the word, we're listening to it, we're applying it. Sometimes when we talk about methods of studying the Bible, we say one of the simple methods that you can do is simply read it and look at it and ask the question, uh, what does it say? And then ask, what does it mean? And then thirdly ask, what does it mean to me? Or observation, interpretation, application. It's a basic way that for uh, folks to study the Bible and James is saying there's a problem if you look at it and say, what does it say and what does it mean? And then walk away. I, um, I was uh, studying uh, fairly late last night and I went to uh, my own notes in uh, this passage on, uh, on James and I wanted to read from them. And, but I need to tell you, <laughs> this is like way too good a writing for it to be me. But it's not footnoted, so I, I don't know who to give credit other than it's not me. But uh, uh, maybe I'll find the source uh, uh, sometime this next week, but I, I just thought it was very good. This writer says, this man starts out very good. He's listening to the word. Uh, the mirror is God's word, of course. When we look into it, we see ourselves as we really are. 
We see our sin in the depths of our sin. My conscience makes me aware of my sin, but only the word of God shows me the depth of my sin. Why? Because in the mirror that is the word, I see not only myself, but I also see Jesus as well. The two together, Jesus and me, reveal the depth of my sin that my conscience could never expose. And read that again. See, I have a conscience. We have a conscience. And when we sin, we blow it. Our conscience is the umpire there saying, hey, you're out of bounds on that one. That's, you're blowing it here. But unless I combine that with the word of God, I'll never see the depth of my sin. I, again, because in the mirror, that is the word, I see not only myself, but also I see Jesus as well. The two together, Jesus and me, reveal the depth of my sin that my conscience could never expose. It goes on. James is trying to make sure that we are aware of a great danger. It is possible to study the word of God, to memorize the word of God, to acquire great knowledge concerning the things of God. Biblical knowledge is the main thing, but it's not the only thing. James says there can be a deception that takes place. We can begin to think that knowledge and information can take the place of devotion and obedience. Uh, and, and that's not where it's at. As I read the word of God, as I study the word of God, I see Jesus and me together. And I don't look too good compared to the holiness and the righteousness of Jesus. I've just noticed that. I don't know if you've noticed that. And I see not only what my conscience could reveal, but something far darker uh, that I need the Lord to, to change in my life, that I need to change my thinking about my repentance, which leads to uh, ultimately, I change my behavior. Now, when he uses the term do what it says or be or doer, James could have used a couple of terms in the Greek there. One of them, he could have used the term that means uh, uh, somebody that's a, kind of a, 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 a weekend, you know, handyman fix-it guy like, like myself. I try to do all the fix repairs, whatever I can on my, on my day off. Uh, there's another term that is the term I, I use Christian because he was a contractor here in the first service. I said like Christian where he's the professional. That's what he does for a living. Highly skilled, got the tools, very good at it. It's dedicated a couple of decades to uh, being, uh, being a builder and, and, and so forth. Guess which term James uses when he says be a doer. He's not talking about the weekend guy. He's talking about the professional. Somebody that, that's, that's their life. <laughs> it's what they do. So when he says, be a doer of the word of God, it's not a weekend thing. It's, it's, it's a full orb thing. It's, it's what your life really uh, surrounds around. It's the, it's the professional doer. And, uh, and of course, James says, if we do that, then that's the person that's blessed. Let me read one more quote from uh, John MacArthur. He says this about this blessed person. When he is especially blessed, he turns to, uh, to the word to find passages of thanksgiving and praise. When he's troubled, he searches for words of comfort, encouragement, strength. Times of confusion, he searches for words of wisdom and guidance. When he's tempted, he searches out God's standard of purity and righteousness for power to resist. The word is the source of deliverance from temptation and trials. It becomes the most welcome friend, not only because of what it delivers us from, but also because of what it delivers us to, glorious, intimate, and living communion with our heavenly Lord. The Bible takes on a whole different, it's just not a book that we study, it's, it's our life. We're listening, uh, we're seeing me and Jesus together in it. I see the depth of my own sin. I, I realize how much more I should love him because of how much more he's forgiven me. Times of trouble, I'm going to the Psalms like we're learning how to do on Wednesday nights. Times of when I'm just thrilled with what God's done, hey, I can go to those passages that help me express my praise and my thanksgiving uh, to the Lord. Man, I'm really troubled because I'm really fighting something here in my life in terms of uh, uh, needing to resist uh, a sin that's out there or besetting me. Hey, I can go to the Word and gain strength and see God's standard for purity and understand that, I'm, that I need to resist that and gain His strength. Uh, again, it, it's... As I do that now, I'm growing in my relationship, uh, in my devotion, my obedience, but ultimately, as he says, a living communion with our heavenly Lord. The last part of the warning, the warning is against not applying the word and, and of course, 
uh, that's the person that builds their house upon the sand. Uh, and again, these two houses look the same until the storm comes. Uh, and it's not if it comes, it's when it comes. And then he says, and it falls, and it falls with a, a great crash. There's one more warning, a fourth one that I haven't mentioned that comes in just at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' warnings came from one who had authority. And that's that last couple of phrases that, and Jesus taught as one who had authority, not as their teachers taught. And we've mentioned this before, but the way it worked uh, was this, but the implication is far greater. The way it worked is that the parables that Jesus taught, the stories that he told, had all been told before. We know now that, they, that other rabbis had told these stories. Jesus is telling the same stories that the other rabbis told. He's using the same illustrations that the other rabbis used. They would be very familiar to their hearers. The difference was when the other rabbis told the story, they would then say, uh, in terms of how it applies in the commentary and teaching, they would have to quote other rabbinical scholars. Rabbi uh, Hillel says this, Rabbi Gamaliel says this, and so forth, because, because they're teaching uh, the word of God, trying to illustrate the word of God, they would never, in a place of humility, they would never then say, and I am the authority, and I can tell you what this really means and how you could apply it. Because only one person can do that, and that's God, because we're talking about God's word. So they would never do that. And then Jesus comes along and he does it. And they, they go, they're amazed. They're amazed because he's saying, I have the authority of God when I teach this. And they go, man, we're amazed. No one's taught like this ever before. You can see why he's kind of rocking their world. Uh, it's, it's not just in what he's saying. He's saying, you want to make it to heaven? You better be more righteous than the Pharisees and the scribes. Wow, who's going to make it then? Well, let me describe it to you. You've heard it said in the past, <clears throat> if you... If you commit adultery, then you're, you're not going to heaven. But I say, if you've even lusted in your heart and your mind, you're not going. I mean, he's just totally, who's going? No one's going then. What's the righteousness that surpasses that? Well, he's going to show them. It's his righteousness. He has the authority of God, and he will live out his life in a perfect, sinless way, and then go to the cross and die for our sins. And then they would finally get it. They're not really getting it at this point. They're just kind of a, this is all shock and awe at this, at this juncture. But he concludes the Sermon on the Mount restating his own authority. He's speaking for God on behalf of God. And they're all amazed. Again, the whole point of the story is that people can be like the, the gal that was the world-class runner that run a race at the end. They're looking for a prize and there is no prize because they've been in the wrong race. There's lots of people, according to Jesus, it's not just here, it's in other places, that believe that they are Christians and they're really not because they thought they got grandfathered in and they never really made a, a, a decision. And, uh, you know, I, I pretty much know everybody here by name, so, uh, but I'm still going to pray. And if, if you have any doubt that you've never made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, then I just want to give you uh, the opportunity to do that as I pray. I just ask you to raise your hands. Not everything, but I'll just agree with you. I'll, I'll pray uh, with you and for you, and, and, uh, and you can have assured that you've actually entered the narrow gate and begun. Is that everything? No, then you, <laughs> you need to start taking the word of God and applying it and, allow, and allowing God to use it to... Change your own heart and your own mind. Nails in your hands, the nail in your feet. They tell me how much you love me. Falls on your brow. They tell me how you bore so much shame to love me. And when I have
And when I 